A medical professionals of Reddit, what was a time where a patient ignored you and almost died because of it? Story one. When I was in med school, had a gentleman in his late 60s come in for chest pain, found to have a large heart attack. Very impressive, STMI in LAD by EKG. Refused emergent cardiac catheterization. Go through the arteries and put a stent to open up the vessels of your heart so he could bring his car home and plan on taking an ambulance back to the hospital. He was on the parking ramp and it cost 20 a day to park. Came back by ambulance in full arrest, no pulse, and died. Doc had to call his son and explain what happened. He was like, yeah, that sounds like dad. He's always been cheap. 20 a day isn't even that bad for parking, is it? It's not great, but it's not that bad. This poor guy did not have his priorities in order. But I guess it's hard to feel like you're about to die if you don't feel like you're about to die. A bit of a sad one to start out with. But funny, a little bit in a morbid kind of way. Story two, had a throat cancer patient. We offered him surgery to remove the tumor. It was a fairly conservative surgery. He left because he didn't want a mutilating surgery, and his daughter-in-law had been studying magnet therapy, and she was, in his words, he came back a year later and was so out of reach from any treatment, his cancer was incredibly advanced, and there was nothing we could do for him. We had a college student come into the ER and had a wonderful case of appendicitis. He needed to get surgery ASAP, as surgery is way easier and safer if done before it ruptures. He called his parents to let them know. They told him to refuse because he had a test upcoming in the week, and they didn't want him to miss it. He left the ER against medical advice while we were all telling him that if your appendicitis gets worse and ruptures, it will definitely or can definitely lead to death. He left the ER against medical advice while we were all telling him that if your appendicitis gets worse and it ruptures, it can definitely lead to death. The kid luckily comes back about 10 hours later after it ruptured. He gets the emergency surgery and the amount of time he got to spend in the hospital probably doubled. Don't mess around with appendicitis, gang. It does not play. Also, recovery isn't that bad if it's dealt with proactively. Like I was in a show with this dude in university who got appendicitis during the rehearsal process and had the surgery like maybe a week and a half before the show opened and literally came back and did the show. Sans appendix. That blew my mind. But seriously, if they're telling you to get it out, just get it out of there. I mean, we have a membership for those who like more naughty and interesting stories that aren't advertiser friendly. Check out the link in the description and join our amazing confessions community so you can support the channel. Story four, had a repeat patient, not quite frequent flyer status as a medic that would always call for a severe allergic reaction to shellfish every other month or so. She had always had the allergy and knew her reactions were getting worse. After a year, six or seven calls of this silliness, my crew and I stayed in the hospital ER with her and talked at length about the situation, since she would always stay quiet about how it kept happening. She told us she comes from a patriarchal culture and her father made this amazing seafood soup. If she didn't eat it and force her body not to reject his gift to the family, she would lose her car, phone, or whatever punishment her father deemed necessary. We pleaded with her to do whatever it took to show him it was deadly and carry EpiPens with her. Fast forward a few years when I altered course into nursing and joined that ER. Saw a familiar bloated face. Turns out she'd gone off to college in another state and hadn't been home for a while, but had visited her folks for a holiday. Of course, she had the soup, and despite hitting herself with the EpiPen when her throat started tightening, the reaction continued. Her mom, who I had never seen before, told me she tried to eat it fast and rushed to the bathroom where she was found on the floor. Medics couldn't tube her in the field, so tried medical management until they could drive her to our ER. Doc performed a tracheotomy at the bedside, and she went to the ICU. Took a week for her to recover, and I was told by the ICU nurses that her father finally got it. That her allergy was a real medical condition. Story 5. I'm a nurse, and I had a very polite and lovely patient trying to remove all manner of chest tubes and IVs after a motorcycle accident. He was obviously delirious from the pain meds and the head injury, but very nice still. I left him in the care of my coworker for lunch. Ten minutes into my lunch break, I see him stagger past the break room door like something out of The Walking Dead, trailing blood everywhere, only to collapse out cold a couple seconds later. He said he needed the bathroom. I don't know how the hell he pulled his own chest tubes out. Removing them always makes me cringe, let alone doing it to yourself. He was put back to bed this time in the ICU and got some more sedation. And even though him ripping it all out set him back a couple of weeks, he was still discharged and came to say hi and thanks on the way out. The happiest, delirious patient I ever had. What a bloody trooper. The idea of pulling tubes out of myself, I can't even take it.
I can't imagine. Uh, no, no, thank you. Story six. We had a mom in the NICU who would constantly kiss her premature baby on the mouth. Several nurses educated her around why that's not safe for the baby and thankfully documented their teachings. This was during cold and flu season and became even more concerning when the mother was coming in with cold-like symptoms. Coughing, sneezing, and obvious congestion. And she still continued to kiss the baby right on the mouth. The baby was almost ready to go home by this time, but got extremely sick. The baby ended up on a ventilator and had quite the extended stay with many, many close calls. Story seven, it happened so often, it was almost a non-issue. We would basically just shrug our shoulders and say, Welp, I had a patient who kept adjusting her insulin dosage against my advice because she was terrified of having her feet amputated like her mom. So she had several occasions of dangerously low blood sugar, one of which put her in the ICU, had a lady who had the opposite problem, raging diabetes, but in deep denial. So she would never take her insulin. So she was in the ICU multiple times for the diabetic ketoacidosis had a ton of patients on dialysis who skipped dialysis for whatever reason, didn't feel like going, had a fight with boyfriend who was her ride, took a vacation to a city without the dialysis unit, etc., etc. So they would come in with their electrolytes all screwed up and had to get emergency dialysis inpatient, had a billion old fat men with chest pain for weeks, refused to come into the hospital to be evaluated for cardiovascular issues, and either die at home or come back a week later with extensive MIS. Half of my patients with COPD were still active smokers, despite my exhortations. One had burned scars over a third of his body from the last time he smoked around his O2 tank. Had patients take extra doses of benzodiazepines, Xanax, Valium, etc., and end up in the hospital with overdoses. Story 8. My wife is a labor and delivery nurse. When a baby is born, they give it some vitamin that the baby can't produce itself for the first six months of its life. I think it's vitamin K to help with blood clotting. It's potentially lethal if the baby doesn't get this, as they can bleed out internally. Well, one mother didn't want their kid getting vitamin K because anti-vaxxer. Baby ended up dying in the NICU. No way to know if the lack of vitamin K contributed to the death or not, but I think most medical professionals would point to it being part of the reason the baby died. Edit. To clarify, the cause of death was related to a bleeding issue. I don't recall the cause of the bleeding or what the specifics of the issue were, but ultimately the baby doesn't get the clotting aid. Baby bleeds to death. Lacking the clotting aid likely played a role in the death. Story nine. Not necessarily the patient, but the caretakers at the facility where the patient was living. I used to visit different board and lodge facilities for adults with mental illnesses and meet the clients to discuss their mental health, set them up with job interviews, therapy sessions, and help them set up their medications for the week if they were unable to do it themselves. Most of these facilities were places for people who had left the hospital and were deemed independent and stable enough to have the freedom to come and go as they pleased in a shared living situation, much like a dorm. Despite having a place to stay and food provided, they were usually pretty poorly supervised by the mental health staff workers there. I often hated these places because while they were ideal for some people, who were truly getting back on their feet and thrived off being able to live a semi-normal independent life, they were way too lax for many of these sicker, more isolating patients who were not at all well and slipping under the radar. Some of this included them not taking their medication as directed, which was one of the requirements for keeping their housing, but unfortunately not strictly enforced. There was one man who had paranoid schizophrenia who was extremely quiet and kept to himself. I had met with him a few times and he seemed to be going downhill in his appearance and general mood. I spoke with his doctor and urged the facility staff to closely monitor him and his medication intake, as I saw in his logs that he often skipped coming in to get his medication at all. I was told they were going to be sitting down with him to remind him of his living agreement and that he had 30 days before losing his housing if he wasn't med compliant. I was also told that his psychiatrist was aware and they may be sending him back to the hospital that week. Apparently this never happened. And he went out into the community and acquired a knife and used it to slice up his roommate while his roommate slept. He carved him from mouth to ear and stabbed him in the stomach several times. The man survived the attack, but the man who had gone off his medication claimed he was being poisoned by his roommate through the window AC unit. For anyone with a violent incident like that on their medical report, it is incredibly unlikely he will ever be able to find a better rehabilitation house ever again.
The system basically screwed over two people that day, as the man who was hurt was already there for PTSD. And as you can imagine, it not only scarred him physically for life, but exacerbated his illness and medication, especially for a schizophrenia patient not being enforced, is not great. It's really unfortunate that this sort of system didn't have good enforcement, because it sounds like a genuinely good place, or at least a place trying to do good things. Mental health is really tough to deal with because everyone's is different. So any situation with lots of people with mental health issues all in one place is going to be problematic in some ways. But it really does sound like there's more from an administration level that could be done here. So yeah, that just sucks. Story 10. My grandpa is the patient. Come straight back if you have any chest pain. He didn't go back, and this is what followed. Blood clot traveled to his brain. Three strokes, bleeding in the brain. Two more minor strokes, paralyzed left arm and right foot. Broca's aphasia. He was a man nearing his 80s who was old school. He worked as a school crossing guard, grew all of his own vegetables, fed the birds, built tables, biked six miles on the weekends, walked everywhere, and was still able to play darts, despite his eyesight being that of a visually impaired. Because he knew the board so well, he went from that to living in a care home and unable to talk. Did he lose his stubbornness, though? Nope. He won't do his rehabilitation, and so even though he could get his speech back to a decent degree, he doesn't want to do the therapy, and using communication cards humiliates him. So we're left trying to decipher random eyebrow movements so we can guess what he's trying to say. One of these days, I swear on my bloody eyelashes, I'm going to shake him until his teeth rattle. Him and his brothers, they're all the bloody same. My uncle, Grandpa's younger brother, didn't go to the hospital at all and was found on his bedroom floor whimpering. He had frickin' sepsis. I can only imagine how frustrating this would be to watch a loved one do something like this. Really just mess themselves up from stubbornness or whatever. It sucks. I want to believe that with time, the amount of people doing this will go down, but I'm not super confident. Story 11. I'm not a medical professional, but I used to get allergy injections to build up my immune system because of the crazy amount of allergies I had. I would get these injections every week, and I was instructed by my family doctor 30 minutes after the injection in case I ever received a reaction. Well, one day I decided I didn't want to wait anymore, also because it had been a few months without a reaction. So I left immediately after my appointment. I went into anaphylactic shock, not even 10 minutes later. It was crazy because I didn't even know what was happening at first. And I didn't even know how to use an EpiPen. I've had this before with like shots and stuff, obviously, where they're like, oh, wait in the waiting room for 30 minutes after receiving it. And every time there's a part of my brain that's like, you could just leave. Like most of the time, no one's watching you. You could just go. You'll be fine. But luckily, there is a louder part of my brain that's like, don't let it be you, man. Don't let it be you. Story 12. I was assistant manager of a group home. We had a resident who had epilepsy and was also very reclusive. He would get agitated if we came in his room or even knocked on the door. However, policy said we had to check on him every 30 minutes because of his seizure risk. That wasn't being done, so I brought this up to the manager. She said she was aware, but it was okay to bend the rules because he would get really upset when we checked in on him. I wasn't really comfortable with her answer, but I was young and assumed that she knew better. When I was on duty, I checked him every 30 minutes. He would yell at me, but I didn't let it bother me. About six months later, after I'd been reassigned to another group home, he had a seizure alone in his room and was found dead a day later. Now I'm older and a little smarter. When I find a problem like this, I stick with it. I don't let people talk me out of it. Not again. Rest in peace, D gone, but not forgotten. Story 13. Patient had vague abdominal symptoms, and I recommended a CT scan. He refused because he was afraid of radiation. He also refused colonoscopy, so all we could do was an ultrasound, which found nothing because he was fat. And abdominal ultrasound is a crappy examination anyway. A year later, he was admitted again. And this time, he wouldn't refuse a CT. And we found a massive colon cancer. I don't know, but he is probably dead now. If you've made it this far in the video, hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It helps the channel grow. Story 14. Me. Didn't almost die, but I was very, very sick. Went for a mini vacation in Indonesia where our villa had a private pool. Throughout our 48-hour stay, I spent more time in the water than out. The time I wasn't in the water, I was in our air-conditioned villa room with just a t-shirt, now damp, over my swimsuit. In the day, it was blazing hot. And at night, it was super windy because it was near the sea. I'm also asthmatic. While it's mostly under control, I usually get a tight chest feeling when I'm ill. And I haven't had a full attack in years. I fell sick after the trip. High fever, runny nose, cough. I'm also a healthcare professional. 
I studied life sciences and diagnostic testing. I'm hardly bothered and can take care of myself when I'm sick. Eventually, the fever went away and I was left with a cough. The week after the vacation, I was still having a cough, and we went to play paintball. Completely overexerted myself, running, ducking, crawling, what have you. After the game, we went to a friend's place to have lunch and chill. I fell asleep, but woke up coughing with the feeling of something being stuck in my respiratory tract. I thought it was phlegm. Went to the bathroom to cough it out, but nothing happened. I lost track of time, and apparently, I was in the bathroom coughing away for about half an hour. Friends asked if I was all right. I just kept saying, yeah, it's a cough. I think there's some phlegm stuck, and I'm trying to get it out. Finally, went to see the doctor, my regular GP, the next day. Turns out I was having a very serious asthma attack. I just couldn't recognize it because I hadn't had one in years. Worst thing is, this was the same doctor who told me to always carry my inhaler around, just in case, but I wasn't diligent about it. Until now, my friends would yell, it's just a cough, I'm fine, whenever I make even the smallest cough or sneeze. Now that I think about it, though, I actually could have died. The ribbing from your friends is actually kind of sweet because it shows that they care about you and your health. Like, yeah, man, last time you said you were fine, you weren't fine. Just getting you to reevaluate every time. Just really make sure. Those are good friends, Opie. Keep them around. Story 15. Not a professional, but a patient who got scared by their doctor. I had my second C-section. My surgeon had to leave before I could be discharged, so the other surgeon gave me my discharge orders. He'd just come back from having to re-sew a woman's abdomen back together because she decided to stand up and pick up her five-year-old the day she left the hospital. While he let me know under no uncertain terms that I'd better not pick up anything over eight pounds or stand up while holding anything or we would have words. Man, he was scary. But he'd also had to push this woman's guts back in and see her terrified child covered in his mom's blood. So uh, anyway, I did not pick up anything heavier than my child for two weeks until they said I could... He also told my husband all about not banging, and he shouldn't even try to talk to me about it for three months. I love to hear doctors that care about their patients, especially when it comes to delivery and stuff. I feel like there's a really bad, uh, I don't know, stereotype, tradition, whatever it may be. We're male doctors who deliver babies. Think of it from a very, I don't know, male mindset, it seems. I think in particular, I'm thinking of the whole incredibly like medical malpractice level bad husband stitch or whatever. And I'm pretty sure in the West, that's like never done anymore because it's terrible. But just that kind of thing really ticks me off, man. So this is a doctor who cares about the well-being of their patient. And that makes me very happy. Story 16. Once, I was the only doctor on duty in a rural village with diminished medical supplies. The village lies in the desert in southern Iraq. A four-year-old child came to what was supposed to be an ER with a diarrhea and some dehydration. They didn't have tap water and they drink from a nearby river. Directly, that is. From what I gathered, it seemed that the child had cholera. Cholera has some unique reputation in medicine that I will skip here for the sake of your appetite. I strongly urged his father to keep him longer for observation, but he refused. A few hours later, he came back and the child was very ill and severely dehydrated. He was, as we describe such cases medically, drowsy. He looked like a rotten wooden doll with the sunken eyes of an old man. I couldn't get an IV access, inaccessible vein for fluids, and didn't have a central line set. I had to cannulate one of the large veins of his neck, and he barely made it. Cholera wasn't endemic there, so I had to make some calls and provide some samples to be tested about 200 miles away, and send the child with an ambulance after he was stable. The father and his son came back a couple of weeks later to visit. I gave him some chlorine tablets and cookies for the kids. Story 17. Had a patient signed out by another ER doc at shift change pending chest x-ray. Chest x-rays showed aortic dissection. This guy should have been dead already. Being a small hospital, a level three trauma center in the middle of nowhere, we call the closest level one for a transfer. Ambulance shows up for a transfer and the guy decides he's not going. He's got enemies in that city and they'll end him. After a standoff in the ER hallway involving security, police, EMTs, multiple docs, nurses, and a very scared scribe, me, the guy, a very large man, gets on board with the plan, and decides not to leave AMA. Later, we find out from the EMTs, he tried to jump out of the ambulance en route to the other hospital. Once he arrived, he left AMA. No clue what happened to him after, but damn, the dissection was insane. Story 18, I doctor here. I had a patient who came in and on evaluation, I determined that her diabetes was out of control by the look of her retinas, which required immediate intervention. I sent her straight to the retina specialist who then scheduled her for an OR. 
She decided that day not to go in because she had work and couldn't afford to take it off. She was cleaning houses and the sprays made her sneeze, causing a massive hemorrhaging in her eyes due to the weakened vascular state from the diabetes. She went immediately blind and got into emergency surgery that day. It took months of recovery and injections to reverse some damages, and now she, years later, has functional vision again. Her kidneys were also failing her and she had no idea. This kicked off a massive lifestyle change and a chain of doctor's appointments that saved her life, all starting from an eye exam. Edit lots of comments about economic reasons to have no showed for her surgery. I don't disagree that it's an awful situation, but the reality is that she had a choice of go blind or go to surgery. The specialist was even willing to curb the cost of her emergency surgery due to her extenuating circumstances. She chose to go blind. Modern medicine thankfully saved her, but her decision she made was objectively the wrong one. You can't make much money blind either. Hindsight, however, is 2020. Story 19. EMT slash paramedic student here. So we had a patient who was morbidly obese and couldn't get out of his house. He decides after about four days of uncontrolled chest pain to call it in. Well, we get there and find evidence of several MIS, but he refuses care and wants us to leave. About 45 minutes later, we get a call from the building he lived in. We got there and it was him in full-blown cardiac arrest. This man was so obese that we couldn't get him through the door and had to knock out a wall and lift him down off the second story with a lift. All the while, me and my paramedic lead were bagging him through an ET tube. Lots of firsts on that call. First ET tube I put in and first IOI ever saw done in the field. Story 20. I'm a psychotherapist who has worked extensively with addicts. Most of them don't take the advice to quit their substance of choice. But one particular case comes to mind with this question. Not only did I impress upon him how important it was for him to stop drinking, but so did his psychiatrist and primary care physician. His PCP eventually fired him as a patient because he wouldn't listen. The guy was jaundiced, in liver failure, and looked like walking death. He lived longer than any of us expected him to, but he finally passed last year because of the damage he did from his heavy drinking. Addiction is a, it's a tough one, man, because the inability to quit is the worst. A large part of the illness itself, or some would say all of the illness itself, everything else is just a symptom of it. That's brutal, that something can literally just be ending someone's life and they can't do anything about it. Or they can, but it's just extremely difficult. I have nothing but sympathy for the vast majority of people who suffer from addiction. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Story 21. I'm a resident. It happens almost every day. Two examples in the last week. Patient comes in with right-sided weakness, almost 24 hours after it started. You can see where this is going. Blood pressure, 190S over 110 gets a stroke workup and of course has a left-sided stroke. He needs to be admitted for BP control and further stroke workup, echo and other lab work. Patient refuses admission, says he's fine and leaves against medical advice. We discharge him on four new meds, BP med, statin, aspirin, and another antiplatelet. Never picks them up. Next day, he's back with left-sided weakness. You guessed it, another stroke. Dude can barely move now. And the second one, patient comes in with NV, tremors, and is in alcohol withdrawal. We load him up with benzos and then barbiturates. He needs admission to ICU because of both alcohol withdrawal and because we loaded him with respiratory depressing and sedating drugs. He says he feels better. Yeah, no crap. We just took you out of withdrawal. He refuses admission and leaves against medical advice. He comes back later that day, barely breathing slash AMS because he went out and pounded 750 milliliters of vodka. Story 22. Not 100% what you're asking for, but like 80%, ah, 50%. Anyway, anyway, when I worked in an assisted living facility, one of our residents, a little old people kind, not step kind, came to the nurse's station and said, you might want to check on Jane. Jane sitting in an armchair, totally silent, staring ahead, left pupil blown, can't speak. 911. CVA. Turned out to be a TIA. Yay. Procedure mandates we call family anytime a resident is sent out. Cheap daughter answered the phone. Ma'am, I need to inform you we've had to send your mother to the emergency room. What? Why? Well, we have to wait for the doctors at the hospital to diagnose her, but she appeared to be having a stroke. Does she have to go to the emergency room for that? Can't she not just go to urgent care? Seeing as how a stroke is literally the death of brain tissue, and she is acutely at risk for another stroke any second, which could easily end her, uh, no, ma'am, she cannot go to an urgent care clinic for this. Huh, she's just blowing through the money dad left. She'll be at this hospital on this avenue if you'd like to meet the ambulance there. This daughter makes me upset. I don't have children, but if I had a child like this, I would be disappointed, man. Absolutely ungrateful, disgusting behavior.
At the same time, I do admit, maybe the daughter had a terrible home life and these were not good parents. Who knows, that could change a lot of things. But assuming they weren't awful to her, ungrateful. Story 23. A friend told me a slightly overweight homeless woman was shooting in her butt and the spot was necrotic. She came in with sepsis and somehow standing and talking with what he could only describe to me as near full body organ failure. They stabilize her. Somehow she survives, but is now missing half a butt. He said two years later, she came back with her foot now rotting off from shooting in between her toes and on her ankle. Same condition, etc. Just now the leg. They amputate and he says she somehow survives again. Except two weeks later, she is pushed back in on a wheelchair, drooling and nearly dead from overdose, put in ICU. Son comes to visit her. At this point, the hospital staff and my friend know her by name, by the multiple visits. She hasn't seen her son in nearly a decade. He convinces her to promise to try to clean up for her grandchildren. Less than 24 hours later, she ODs again, inside the hospital bathroom. Somehow having snuck her kid in, nobody knows how. Friend said she was on the toilet with the needle in her arm, still warm, but very, very dead. And this is a great example of how crazy addiction is. This woman was losing body parts. Clearly, it was not going well for her. And yet, drugs are insanely powerful. She just couldn't stop. And it's tough because I understand to be able to stop, you have to want to stop first. And it's impossible to tell, in each case, if the person truly does want to stop. But the chokehold it had on this woman is tragic, nonetheless, I think. Story 24. I had an accident when I was around 12. TLDR fell from a fair height into water onto my back and got trapped. This is when I started to get strange, horrendous leg pain. It would creep through my legs, burning, tingling, and like pins and needles plus intense pain. Lasts for hours or sometimes a whole day and then just slowly disappears. My mom took me to the hospital once because it happened while I was at school and they freaked out at how much pain I was in. Yard doctors told me to get the hell out because it was leg cramps. My mom told me it was because I crossed my legs too much. Seven years later, I meet someone, and they push me to go see a doctor. GP sends me for CT scans, and they find nothing. They refer me to a neurologist. They instantly send me for an MRI. Instantly finds out I tore my spinal cord in the original accident. And the intense nerve pain is from a buildup on fluid in the gap in the cord. It's uncommon, but not rare. But watching doctors Google your condition in front of you with a what-the-hell expression on their faces is kind of entertaining. Story 25. Like many others have stated, this happens so regularly that it's almost hard to think of a specific instance. However, I do have one. It's not about a patient, but it's about a patient's family member. I had a patient in the ICU for some respiratory issue that I can't even really remember now. He had chronic pain and some mental health issues as baseline. And he had this codependent girlfriend who was a very nice lady, but very present at his bedside at all times. Constantly beside herself with worry that he wasn't getting enough pain medication. He was and that he wasn't getting enough sleep. He wasn't, but nobody does in the ICU. We kept reassuring her that we're giving him meds and to not worry. The day he transferred out of the ICU, I was working a night shift and heard a code blue paged overhead. It was for him. He'd gone into respiratory arrest, was fortunately found right away, intubated, resuscitated, and came right back into my ICU. After some digging, and after he was able to wake up and give us some info, we found out that his girlfriend was worried he wasn't going to be able to sleep. So, she bought some Seroquel on the street and gave it to him, and his dumb butt took it. He was already on his home dose of Seroquel and opioids, plus some additional opioids for the acute pain of whatever was going on with him. The sedation from that extra Seroquel in conjunction with the rest of his meds tipped his already not-so-great respiratory issues into full arrest. Once he woke up, he was mortified and asked she not be allowed to visit him anymore. I had to call and tell her she was not allowed to visit him anymore and that hospital security had been alerted. She was, uh, not happy. The lesson? If someone is hospitalized, we will provide the appropriate medications. You do not need to bring in extra meds you bought on the street. We got it. Well, that's impressively bad decision-making. Him? He gets a little bit of a pass because he's sedated. He's got meds in him already not thinking the clearest, right? Her? Concerning. Very, very concerning. Sure, maybe I think the doctors aren't doing their job as well as they could because I love this person and I'm worried for them and obviously you're going to be really concerned and critical of the people treating him. Fine, makes sense. Buying medicine and giving it to him in the hospital while he's already on a ton of medicine, that's just a whole other level. You are not just concerned for this person, you're kind of controlling and uh, 
you got to step back is what I'm saying. I can only imagine this poor guy was probably traumatized and did not trust his partner so much after that. Unfortunate. Anyway, that will be the last story for today. I think what we've learned from this one is just listen to your doctors if they tell you specific things. Not to say don't get second opinions on things and stuff like that, but if you're in the ER on meds and your doctor's like, hey, don't take these meds or don't do this, probably just don't do that. Seems like a good plan. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and click the link in the description to join our community. You can check out this video on your screen in the meantime, and I will see you in the next one.